Okay, we're starting now. <laughs> Well fed and watered? Yes. <coughs> I, I wanted to actually change gears a little now and uh, and focus on some emotions. Yes. Um, and the first person's emotions I'm going to focus on on my own. Is that okay? And what I've noticed in uh, having this discussion with you is that any time that I start talking about myself as Jesus, I get a fairly strong projection of emotion, emotional denial data from many of the people in the audience. And, uh, and I don't want to comment on your own emotions about why you're doing that. Right? What I want to do is comment about my own feelings when that's happening. Because what's happening in this group, more so than almost any other group for me, is that I'm getting very, very strong lower back pain in the, in the bottom there, uh, which is all caused by my unresolved unworthiness issues. So what actually happens when you project that emotion at me is instead of it passing straight through me, it just connects with my unworthiness issues and I just feel more unworthy. Right? And so that's something that I'm having to work on while I'm actually talking with you is just to feel those unworthy feelings that are being that are, that are being triggered by that projection. <coughs> and that also has the effect of um, sort of closing me up here. And the reason why that's happening is because when I feel the projection from you of denial or disbelief, then I feel like I'm not allowed to say exactly what I want to say. And so there's that other feeling associated with the unworthiness of I'm not allowed to speak the truth to you. I'm not allowed to speak what's in my heart to you. I've got to modify that to suit what you're feeling. Right? So that's still something that comes from my, my unworthiness issues. My unworthiness issues mean that I have a desire to try to make things easier for you. And in the process of doing that, I'm shutting down like my, my, my <coughs> voice is, I'm finding it hard to speak at different times because of the closing up of my voice because I can't say exactly what I feel. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So while I've been having this conversation with you, I've been trying to feel about those emotions and uh, just allowing myself to connect with those emotions. And I understand that it's very, very difficult for you to accept what I'm saying to you, particularly about my identity. Yeah. Right? And I understand that it is hard for you to actually not project those emotions. Mm -hmm. But the more you project them, the more inclined I am to actually stop talking to you altogether and walk out. Can you understand why? Yeah. Yeah. The reason why is because if I have a sense of worthiness, then I can feel when a person doesn't want to listen to me and I'll say, well, that's okay, You're not, you don't have to listen to me. And so I would leave, straight away. And so that's the emotion I'm having to work through now, is whether, what do I do? Do I continue and have those continued emotions projected at me? Or are you going to own some of those emotions and start looking at the reasons why you're finding it so difficult to believe? And I'm not expecting you to believe. What I'm asking you to do is to own your own emotion rather than projecting it at me. You follow me? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and if you can do that, then I can stick around and stay, even though you may not feel that I am who I'm say, saying I am. But if you're going to project the emotion at me, then what's going to happen is I will then have to say at some point, well, enough's enough, if I have any sense of worthiness within myself. And then I'd have to say, well, enough's enough, 
at the moment, a lot of this group is finding it difficult to accept that, and so I'll have to just either decide, do I stop talking about that altogether, or do I go? Mm. So that's just something that's happening for me right at the moment. Mm. I'd like to talk about something that's been happening this week for me as well, <coughs> if I can. And a lot of my emotions that I'm processing at the moment are about how my soulmate feels about me. And I'm finding them really, really difficult. Uh, it's like, the, way, the best way I can describe it is, if you can imagine that you can remember being with somebody for 2,000 years, <coughs> right? and, you can, and you can feel and remember many of the experiences that you've had together. And then... In this life, the, my worst emotions have been actually to do with separation from my soulmate and from God. That the, the emotions that occurred in the womb with my, when, my, when I incarnated were so difficult for me that I'm still actually processing through those emotions. And a few months ago, I met my soulmate. And, uh, and within a few months, uh, only a few weeks ago, um, she told me many things about, about, that she didn't like about me <laughs> and, and then we didn't feel that we could spend time together, we had to deal with those emotions. But the emotions that, that I feel from that are huge emotions of rejection. And so a lot of them are based around feelings from um, that I've at last met my girl uh, who I've had a longing for all of this life. And I know who she is, but she doesn't want to know me. And she doesn't want to be with me. And uh, also there's many things about me that she doesn't like. Uh, mostly physical things. Um, so that is, I'm finding that very, very difficult. There's, thing, there's so many things about me that I can't change that she doesn't like. Um, if it was to do with characteristics of the soul, that I can mm. deal with those at the moment, but the other things I find difficult. And so this week I've been uh, probably crying about three or four hours every day about that, about these feelings of rejection. But at some stages when I stop crying, what happens is I get into this short state, space of anger with her. <coughs> and as soon as I'm in a space of anger, I realise that I'm staying away from the emotion of grief that I, that I need to stay get back into. And so I always try to get back into that emotion of grief. And, and it's been quite exhausting because of mm. that, because uh, it's been pretty constant. And uh, so, so the emotions that I'm working through at the moment are very much related to unworthiness with God and unworthiness with my soulmate, and which also relates to unworthiness with women generally. And so I've attracted in my life many women who have treated me like I'm not good enough for them. You know? When I say many, I've only ever had three relationships, but um, each relationship has, has been this projection of emotion. So, um, obviously the big emotions that I'm dealing with at the moment is this deep feeling of unworthiness, a deep feeling of sexual unworthiness, and a deep feeling that I'm not attractive or not, and not lovable. Right? So, and in particular, what it's about is that my soulmate doesn't find me attractive or lovable. Right? So it's to do with that relationship. And, uh, and so um, all of those emotions are quite deep within me and have been quite deep within me all my life when I look back at my life. And so they're the emotions that I'm dealing with this week. Now, is there any comments you want to make about that? Me or questions? <laughs> no, no, just me too. <laughs> you too. <laughs> That's how I feel. Yeah. Mm. Just when people don't like you. Yeah. And you give them everything that you. Yeah. Want, or you feel. Do you mind me saying a little bit about your situation? Yeah, Lisa? Okay. Um, Lisa's just going through a breakup um, of a marriage, um, and and feeling. That's why she's feeling many of the same emotions that I'm feeling. A feeling of rejection and unworthiness and those kind of emotions. But they are all actually related to childhood issues, mm -hmm. as you know. Yeah. And more, all of mine are related to <coughs> incarnation issues. Uh, the mm -hmm. feeling of separation from my soulmate and that I was to blame for that somehow. And the feeling of separation from God and that I was to blame for that. 
because my mother felt she was to blame for everything, and she still does actually feel that she was to blame for everything. Mm -hmm. With um, with your soulmate, mm -hmm. you said there's 16 years difference from the time you reincarnated. Yeah. Why did she reincarnate? Um, because she didn't have to, did she? Yeah, really. She did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's uh, there's issues with the joining together of the soul, but obviously. We plan for her reincarnation anyway because it's really important that uh, the feminine side of the whole thing that began in the first century is actually is actually dealt with because in the first century there was a lot of denial of the feminine and uh, and that's caused a lot of problems in history. It's also caused a lot of problems with the Christian religious faith that have uh, followed as a subsequent result. And there's a lot of things like that that we both want to correct. Um, a lot of untruths about women generally and women in religion and women's relationship to God specifically. Um, so there'll be a lot of uh, things that we start talking about about the balance between the masculine and the feminine. And one of the main things that we wanted to do when we made the decision to return was to actually have the soul union occur in a physical state so that you could see the results of that and, and and so that you could see the results of what it's like to live in a soul union state mm -hmm. while you're on earth. So that's your goal, is it? Yeah, to, to actually demonstrate a 20 second <coughs> sphere soul union state while we're on earth, which is what God's intention really was in, in terms of your, your future. Yeah. Is your grief um, because your soulmate has rejected you or because you don't know how to deal with the grief? No, my grief is related to the issues of, re of reincarnation and, and some events that occurred in the first century. And yesterday people told me to get over it. Mm. And <laughs> <laughs> regarding our relationship. Um, no, I think sometimes people, you know, when they break up, uh, break away is probably a new life holiday. <laughs> I mean, you yeah. probably have another life anyway, so <laughs> you can meet up again and tie the difference, you might like it. <laughs> no, I, see, I don't believe what you believe regarding those things. Um, no. Yeah. I don't, I'm not saying I believe that, but I've got an open mind of everything. Yep. And I don't believe, I just believe a lot of stuff. <laughs> so I, just, um, I take it as it comes. But that is also, at the moment, your emotional protection for you. No. <laughs> it wasn't a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's not. <laughs> You'll find in the future that it is. But I, I, you know, that often what we do is we um, allow ourselves to, to be open to accepting everything, but in the end we don't accept anything. We don't accept anything into our heart because we're so afraid to make a choice. I accept things. But I accept things um, not because whether I believe them or not. If there's somebody else believes them, that's okay. I accept they believe it. I can respect <coughs> any uh, person's beliefs. Yep. They've got the right to believe whatever they feel yep. like. I'm not talking about that though. I'm talking about this choice that's going on inside of your soul. But I, I know you don't want to hear what I'm saying, so that's fine. I don't <laughs> care what you say. <laughs> that's not the emotion coming from me. <laughs> Yeah, AJ, this uh, soulmate, how do you know you met your soulmate on a personal viewpoint? That's, um, uh, you mean in terms of for anyone meeting their soulmate? Yeah, you connected or, or happened to meet or, or you just look at someone. I, I haven't been down that road. Right? And the paper. Nor have I. And the I'm Jesus looking for my soulmate. <laughs> You should actually do it and see what happens. <laughs> um, in answer to your question, um, most of us have injuries with the feminine or the masculine or both. The reason why we have those injuries is because when we were children, obviously our parents have injuries with femininity or masculinity or both, and generally with both. And our parents have a combination of, like our, our father would have certain injuries regarding his mother and his father and our mother would have certain injuries regarding her mother and her father. And the combination of those two things creates inside of us a, a list of emotions, if you like, that cause our attractions. So if I'm a male 
and my mother and father have certain injuries and I identify in particular with one of those parents. So let's say I, in my case I identified with my mother's injuries. I then take on many of those injuries towards <coughs> myself as a male. So my mother's injuries towards her father were that, you know, her father was an abusive drunkard <coughs> and he abused his, his wife and, and some of his children, or all of his children. And, and my mother's emotions about that obviously are quite strong in terms of negatively strong about men generally. And then my father also has quite a few emotions about himself as a man that, uh, that are quite strong in the sense of, uh, of unworthiness and feelings like that. Now, I, when I incarnated into those environments, add that to the feeling that I've just lost my father, my heavenly father, and lost my soulmate. And that it's all my fault. And that created within me all these groups of emotions that, that then created my attractions. And so I was attracted to women who, I could, who were like my mother, who I could, who I could help and look after. And, uh, and ironically, they couldn't love me and they were always stressed out by me as a result. Because of course I wasn't being loving. I was actually wanting to be their father, really, in a way. And so, um, obviously, that attracted, uh, um, that that created so many different. I had so many different injuries about masculinity and femininity within myself. What I had to do before I could actually know who my soulmate was was actually work through those injuries, emotionally, work through those injuries. So I had to let go, and um, by letting go, emotionally experience what all of those injuries were about. <coughs> and uh, that took, that's, that's taken me uh, nearly, well it's taken, it, it took 11 years before I met my soulmate after beginning that process. Um, because I was not before that time ready to even recognise her. Um, so my suggestion, if you want to meet your soulmate, mm. is firstly, to focus on dealing with every <coughs> single emotional injury within yourself relating to masculinity or femininity. Once you deal with those, there's a very high likelihood you, you, it'll just come to you who your soulmate is. Now that being said, there's some people I know uh, overseas who have spent, who, who have just basically focused their energy on wanting to deal with their own emotions. <clears throat> and what they've done is they've actually longed to God, they've actually prayed to God to know who their soulmate is and long that, to, to God that whatever happens that they can trigger their emotions inside of themselves so they can meet their soulmate. And I know one lady in particular who did this and within two weeks she knew exactly who her soulmate was. And she's not with him. She, she's uh, she's she's in a married she's married and she knows who her soulmate was and her, and her soulmate's not her husband. And uh, her soulmate lives in another country actually. Um, but now what she's doing is working through her emotional injuries that prevents mm. them from being together. Now once she does that, he will automatically be attracted into her life. And this is what I found myself like as I was working through those injuries. I all of a sudden feeling like oh, I've got to move to Queensland. Uh, I live in South Australia. I lived in South Australia all my life, but I just felt like I've got to move to Queensland. And initially, I was thinking, oh, Airlie Beach or <laughs> somewhere like that. And I actually, at one stage of my life, had some property developments that was happening up there, and uh, and I thought that would be the way place I would go. But then one day, I just decided oh, I've got to go to Queensland, and I came to Brisbane, and then I just drove up the coast, and I drove up the coast checking out different things, going to spiritual churches and a few other things. And, and I finished up meeting up with this medium. Uh, her name is Hannah. She lives right away up at um, Glenelda, I think it is, which is sort of near Harvey Bay. And so I drove all the way out there. And as I drove, I drove through Gympie. And what do I see at Signs on the Razor? All this Mary stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you see that every day, right? All right. So if you drive out that way. The Mary River, of course. Mm. Me, though, I'm having these huge emotions <clears throat> driving up there. My Mary's here somewhere. Like, my Mary's here somewhere. So I just felt that, yeah, somewhere around Gympie was, was Mary, you know. 
And as it turned out, I met this man as a result of meeting this medium who invited me up to give some talks where I met people like Helga and Gloria and different ones and, and uh, um, Angela and Gary and different ones that I've met that, you know, are now <coughs> in time with. And, and, uh, and so he, he decided he wanted to run a few groups, so I did a few groups there. And guess who came along? Uh, Not Mary. <laughs> parents. Her parents. <laughs> And so I met her parents, and uh, this was a year ago, over a year ago now, 18 months ago. And so, unbeknown to me, my own soulmate's parents I'd just met. Um, and, I, and I've even seen photos of, of her um, when I visited their home. Um, and they began running some groups in their home, and I occasionally visited their home and did those groups. And, and I'd see photos of Mary, but I, you know, it wasn't anything to do with the photo or anything, or how she looked or anything like that. She was in Lebanon at the time, living there. And I knew, I had a feeling as well that although my soulmate is somewhere around here, she's actually overseas, mm. was the feeling I had. And so what happens after a while is you start, because you're connected with your emotions and your feelings, and you're releasing these injuries about masculinity and femininity, you're starting now to attract your soulmate back to you. Mm -hmm. right? Now, at the same time, unbeknown to me, but we've now talked about it, at the same time, Mary, I go through this huge turmoil in about November of last year where I'm feeling like my soulmate's lost to me for good. <clears throat> that was the feeling I was having. And I went, uh, I think some of you knew about that, and I went down to the Sunshine Coast and I just stayed there for a week. And the feeling I had was three quarters of the way into the week was that, hang a sec, no, no, actually everything's going to be all right now. Unbeknown to me, right at that same moment, the same week, she was considering getting married to a man in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. right. And I didn't know. And I only found out this recently. And by the end of the week, they'd broken up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a month later, she's back in Australia. And I met her four or five days, a few weeks after she came back. Because her parents ran a group <laughs> at their place, which I attended. And, and so I met her for the first time, I, and I knew instantly who I'd just met. Um, but she didn't know at all, and still doesn't really believe it either, uh, although she has certain emotions associated with it now. So I met her right <coughs> there, and then her first emotion towards me was a week later, was one of extreme anger. <laughs> and uh, it's due to some things coming up from her feelings about the first century and the choices that I made in the first century. So I suppose what I'm saying is, after all of that, is that if you deal with your masculine and feminine emotional injuries <coughs> and you then start trusting where your soul is leading you, <coughs> you will actually find the soulmate. And then, because you've dealt with the masculine and feminine injuries inside of yourself, when you meet her, you will know who she is or him. You'll know who he is. And, and as a result of that, you may have lots of emotions to deal with as well because they may reject you. <laughs> and you will need to work through those emotions too if you still have them. But if you go through that process, you will definitely meet your soulmate here on earth. Pretty much guaranteed. Yeah, well, <coughs> okay, um, I just want to thank you for sharing your emotions. Um, that really touched me. Yeah. So thank you. Um, I feel a bit guilty because yesterday I said I didn't really believe that you were Jesus. Although I didn't say these things earlier to make you feel guilty. No, no, I know you didn't. <coughs> Although, you know, the content is so beautiful and I you know yeah. really get such a beautiful energy from you. Yeah. And so, you know, I sort of sat here just then thinking, well, what's going on with me that I instantly said, well, I think that's crap that you're Jesus. And um, I think it's, I mean, I'm not sure because, you know, I can't process stuff yeah. at the moment because I feel a bit, I don't know. But I think it's to do with my own unworthiness. Mm. You know, that how could Jesus be in my backyard? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I've heard, been exploring this new age sort of stuff for 30 years and yeah. Um, I heard about the, you know, second coming of Jesus and stuff, and then how can he be in my backyard? I mean, mm -hmm. like my, you know, I just can't compute with that. Yeah. You know, to, 
to do with, you know, perhaps this deep unworthiness. Yeah. And, that, and that's the thing is that I, what I find is when I say, when I talk about myself being Jesus, the biggest projections I get generally are related to the fact that people then think I'm saying that I'm better than them. Mm -hmm. And so that automatically mm -hmm. then triggers any feelings of unworthiness that they have within themselves, which of course they, because they don't want to feel, yeah. project back at me as anger or some other kind of emotion that's a capping emotion. And I'm just saying who I am because if I stay in my truth, I have to say it. The other thing I learned quite early in my own progression, which um, mm -hmm. when, when I found the divine love path again, it was five years ago when I found my path again. So I've been dealing with my emotions for 12 years, but it was only five years ago that I actually found like all these things just came to me of memories, just memories that came to me. And, and I felt like I rediscovered everything again at that stage. And when I went through that, um, one of the things that came to me was that, that people would reject me if I said who I was. And that was a deep fear that I had. Um, and so what I had to do then is work through those fears emotionally, of course, because I was also afraid of dying again as a result of saying who I am. And I'll tell you why, uh, as we talk maybe, because there's some first century emotions related to, to many of these things. But what actually happened was that um, I had to work through these emotions in such a way that eventually I had to come to see whether I was Jesus or not, or whether there was just a spirit influencing me somehow, or all these different possibilities that I knew of. It could be, you know. And so what I had to do then was uh, go through and resolve the issue between myself and God, really. And I had to test out my relationship with God and see when the divine love flows. And when the divine love flows, you can feel it flowing through you. And you can also feel it when it stops. And so what I had to do then, the only thing I could do, and I was never, there was never any mediumship, I was never told by any person who, who I was. And, and um, since I have been, after I've worked it out myself, but only after I've worked it out myself, there's been many people who've come and told me that they know of Jesus. But... Um, before, no, none of that happened at the start. What I had to do was I had to work through emotionally the issue between myself and God, which was quite a long-winded process for me. It took me eight months to do that. And of dealing with my emotions pretty much every day. Um, and a lot of that process was very, very difficult um, for me as well, because it's like having a split identity almost um, for, for some time before, before I could actually cope with it intellectually. Then, of course, all of the memories and all of the feelings and all of the other things that were flowing as well were confusing enough because uh, I knew I didn't have any of those experiences in my life. And so I had to go through and actually resolve all those issues with God. So what I found was that every time that I refused to accept the truth about my identity, my connection with God <coughs> would cease and I would be in a state where I was alone again. And when, when, I, when I could intellectually accept, at least, and not emotionally accept yet that I was, then mm -hmm. I would start feeling the flow of divine love again. And so the only way that in the end that I could determine the truth about that issue myself was all of these feelings and emotions and memories were coming to me, but I feel unworthy to be Jesus. Right? And so because of that, um, I could not accept all of these memories of, that were coming to me. So I'm having all these memories of my first century life and my spirit life, and I'm writing them all down frantically. <laughs> so I've got books of them, but but I can't accept them because I can't accept that I am Jesus right? because of the un feelings of unworthiness. <clears throat> but every time I ref I've refused to accept it, my connection with God would stop. So then I was in this conundrum, if you like. What do I do? Do I if I I wanted to teach because it's always been a desire to, to teach the truth if I found it and I felt I, I knew it and found it. But on the other side, every time I didn't say, every time I stopped saying that I was Jesus or didn't want to say I was Jesus, I, my connection with God stopped and then I couldn't teach either. So it, it, it set up all of this conundrum which took, took a, a number of years for me to resolve, uh, emotionally resolve them. And, uh, and in a lot of ways, I'm still, because of the unworthiness issue, still being present. 
um, it still comes up in groups in particular. And that's one of the reasons, in fact, at the moment, it's probably the only reason why I'm doing groups. Because um, I do get a lot of projections of emotions in a group. And the beauty of that is that it exposes the areas within myself that are still unhealed. And that's why I keep doing it. We, pro we promise to keep doing that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just one other thing. I can't believe Mary finds you, you has issues with you physically. Many of us find you very incredibly <laughs> sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a son. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm his son, and I think it's now I feel embarrassed. <laughs> um, her, her issues are not revolving so much about the physical, but more to do with issues of security. Um, the feeling that she has from the first century was that I didn't keep her secure. And one of the feelings that she reincarnated with was this desire to have a man keep her secure. Her father is quite a, a, a well-built man and, and mm. stocky, mm. and um, that's her image of somebody yeah. who can protect her, who can keep her secure. She doesn't, <coughs> she hasn't, because she's yet to feel through that emotional mm. process. She she views me as being too slight to be to, to be protect her. Snap! You could snap. Hey, I, I might break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. I might. <laughs> um, and so, you know, um, a lot of it's to do with that. Mm. But a lot of it is also what happened, we were to, we've been together for two months. Um, mm -hmm. And we were overseas, and she met up with me overseas. Um, and we were together for a couple of months. And during those few months, a lot of emotions come up for her, and a lot of memories come up for her about her first century life. Now, if you can just imagine for a moment, you're, you're 30 years of age around about, and for the first moment in your life, you're having memories about a 2,000-year-old person. And they feel like they're your memories. So how's that going to feel for you? It's going to be very scary. She's had a very good upbringing compared to myself, perhaps. Like, her, her family have been much more loving and caring with her than my family have with me. And she... Um, the way we split our emotions was that she had a terrible time in the first century. She had lots of abuse and rape issues in the first century to deal with. Um, and, you know, her life after I passed was very hard as well. And I took many of those memories. When you're in the soul union state, you can actually take memories and split up the memories that you have as a complete soul. So I took many of her memories. So I came into the world believing that I'd been abused and sexually abused and raped. Um, whereas she came in feeling free of all of those things. Um, so I've had to work my way through all of those kinds of emotions as well. Now, she obviously, having a, a much more, shall we call it, normal existence, um, this is a major confronting thing for her, as you can understand. And, uh, and I understand completely like the emotions that she's going through. One of the emotions that she's facing mostly is the emotion of anger towards me. In the first century, I did make choices where I knew she was out of harmony with love and I was in harmony with love, so I made the choice in harmony with love. But because we were a couple, she believed that I was actually making choices and not, and not doing it together. And she wanted me to do it together. So obviously there were quite a number of those kind of emotions. She was also quite angry for me for, for choosing to die, uh, as she sees it. Um, and she feels that I left her, abandoned her, and she's still got a lot of those emotions as well. There's also emotions of shame about the memories uh, that she has about her first century life, particularly sexual shame and shame related to some of the events that occurred around her life. And, and it's very, very scary for her to even contemplate dealing with any first century emotion. So, the way she's feeling at the moment, or the last time I spoke with her, was that she dearly wants to follow the divine love path. But, she dearly does not want to have any first century emotions. <laughs> now, that's a pretty difficult conundrum to be in for her. Because most of her causal emotions are related to the first century just like all of mine have been related to the first century. And so it's uh, very, very difficult for her now to, to feel. So, but she, she, like, when you meet her, 
And she's a very beautiful person. And you will see her strength of character. And you will also see her humility too. She's a very humble person. But at the moment, not humble about dealing with first century emotions. Yeah. And it's very, like, it took, like I said, it took me years to work through these issues that she's been confronted with over a space of two months. Yeah. Is it not possible to draw a parallel between these projections that happen because of the Jesus um, belief and the soulmate uh, issue? Like, um, is it for me, like, I feel that the um, that if I, I have to feel the soulmate, that to believe somebody is my soulmate is, is, is irrelevant, really. Mm -hmm. And is it not the same then? To, because, because a soulmate is really like a, a love union, so it has to be felt. Mm -hmm. Totally. And, and uh, is it not the same then with, um, with uh, you know, the Jesus thing, the Jesus, yeah. um, that whether someone believes you Jesus, what they do not believe it is in the end irrelevant. Exactly. What matters is if they can feel yep. your Jesus-ness or the, the qualities of Jesus in you. Yep. And honestly, what I'm also learning over the last uh, probably three months in particular is that I need to give up the need for anything from anyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a very, very huge statement when you think about it. Mm -hmm. It means that you're going to give up the need for somebody to treat you nicely. You're going to give mm -hmm. up the need for somebody to treat you like they love you. You're going to give up the need for somebody to want you or desire you. You're yes. going to give up the need to do any of those understand things. Understand you. Understand you. You're going to give up the need for someone to understand you. You're going to give up the need for someone to be loving to you. All of those needs eventually will all disappear because love only gives. Uh, love doesn't demand. <clears throat> something in return. And so one of the huge uh, things that I'm working through at the moment is how I've set up demands from my soulmate before I even met her. Mm. One of the th demands that I had from my soulmate before I met her was I wanted her to love me. Uh, I wanted her to desire me. I wanted her to have these feelings of wanting to open up her heart to me. And I wanted to have these feelings of, you know, desiring to be open with me. And all of those things are projections of what I was wanting from her, and they are unloving projections that I need to now own and I need to work my way through. And so that has been really confronting as well. Actually loving somebody with all my heart and yet not feeling like I need, I don't even have a feeling within me at some point in the future because it's not how it is now. <laughs> I don't have a feeling within me that I need anything in return from her. Mm. My understanding of love, I mean, perhaps it's a limited one who said love is about give and take, and you know, the cycle is a, no. like, that's just a new age. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Love, love is not about <laughs> give and take. Does God take <laughs> from you? <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Yeah. It's, uh, and that's why in the first century said there's more happiness in giving than there is in receiving. And, and in every celestial spirit is in a state where they give love, but, but particularly from people on earth, very rarely receive it. And yet they can continue giving love. And, uh, you know, one thing that I've often connected with myself with the soulmate issue is there, there have been soulmates where the soulmates in one soulmate part, uh, half is in the celestial spheres and the other half is in the first sphere in the hells not receiving any love at all from, and not giving any love at all to the soulmate, and yet that soulmate is in complete bliss and happiness. And then I'm looking at my own relationship saying, I'm not in complete bliss and happiness. <laughs> I'm badly needy. Like, I need my soulmate to love me, you know. And so what I've got to do then is go, why am I needing that? What's going on within me that causes me to have these huge needs for her to love me? What, what's happening inside of myself? What's the feeling I'm avoiding? Mm. And I'll show you some of the things that I've written. They're a little personal, but my soulmate won't like seeing this video if she sees it. <laughs> because she doesn't like anything private being public. So my apologies to my soulmate. But it's important. So one other thing is my soulmate did say to me that I need to be open and more open and honest about my emotions. <laughs> yes. So that's what I'm doing. And 
So, yeah, um, here's one. This was on the 7th of June. Um, I'm getting major projections of anger and fear from Mary. Major rejection. Feels like she wants nothing to do with me at all. I feel like we were overseas and I feel like going home without her. I feel like she hates me and hates me being alive. I feel like if I died, she'd be happier. So the expectation I have is that Mary longs for me like I do her. Right? The reality is that Mary dislikes me in her life because of the emotions that are getting triggered within her and she wants to avoid me. And what am I avoiding? I'm avoiding the feelings of being rejected by my soulmate. I'm avoiding feeling that the soulmate hates me and would rather that I'd never been born. So, you know, that's still a big emotion for me. That's just what you're feeling. That's not the truth. It doesn't, doesn't matter if it's not the truth. But you're into truth. No, 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 you don't understand. This is an emotional error that I need to get out of me. The only way I can experience an emotional error is to actually admit the truth of what I'm feeling to myself. You follow me? So if I feel right now, I feel, I know it's an error. And I, and, but, I, but telling myself that it's not an error is not going to benefit me. What I need to do is just feel that my soulmate feels I'd rather never been born. I need to feel that, because that's an emotion in me still. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. But isn't there a, uh, an emotion even deeper than that? Oh, certainly. <laughs> I'm just listing a few <laughs> from my journal. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, here's a good one. I don't know if Mary will like this one, but sorry, Mary. Um, the day ended with a phone call to Mary in Switzerland. I was, I was in England and she was in Switzerland. And the phone call ended with Mary telling me to fuck off <laughs> and hanging up on me. She was so angry with me and most of the time I can feel her hatred. And my expectation is that Mary treats me well. And the reality is that she's not capable of treating me well because she doesn't want to fully choose all of her emotion. So she was willing to project it onto me. And I, what I'm avoiding, I'm avoiding feeling mm -hmm. unloved, hated and rejected by my soul. And like, I can still feel those emotions in me even though I've been crying about them since mm -hmm. the 7th of June. Mm -hmm. So the 7th of June is now like, it's five weeks. Mm -hmm. Is it as intense as it was then, the emotion? No, it's not. So it is healing. But I can still feel it. Mm. It's, it's, it's interesting, it's totally different uh, feeling by yourself than it is saying to somebody else that you, you know, so yeah. this is interesting for me too, because I don't normally <coughs> talk about my emotions very much. Yeah. You were talking before about giving and uh, give and take stuff, but the, like it's really been fully, fully aware too when we're giving some things aren't loving when we're giving, eh? Because I've learned that lesson yeah. of where I thought I was always giving because I was loving. Yeah. None of it was. I wasn't loving to myself. I was over giving. Yeah. What happened there was I had. I was. I was in England at the time, and uh, I woke up one morning, and I just had this major realization. And soul realizations are like light bulb moments, aren't they? Mm -hmm. You know, just bang, you've got them. And this this major realization that that every time I had a desire for something outside of myself, mm -hmm. aside from my desire for God, because God can fulfill all my desires, right? But every time I have a desire for something outside of myself that has nothing to do with God, I am setting up the possibility and the most likely possibility of my being disappointed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as soon as I do that, obviously I'm going to set up the emotional possibility of having lots of pain and hurt as well. Mm -hmm. So then I realised that I had to, the only, but I had to deal with this emotionally. I can't deal with this intellectually, right? Every time you try and deal with something intellectually, you skip over heaps of emotions. Mm -hmm. So what I had to do then was I had to work through the emotions of what I was desiring outside of myself and why. So for example, I was desiring people to treat me justly. For example, I give my time freely to people, and yet very few in the mm -hmm. past have done the same for themselves. Mm -hmm. Most people have wanted to charge me for anything they've given me. And, I, and there's a feeling of injustice inside mm. of me about that, right? And the feeling of injustice has been created because I've set it up. I've set it up because I've actually had this desire for something outside of myself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And because I've had this desire for something outside of myself, 
which is for somebody else to treat me justly, I'm going to be disappointed. Now, what I've had to do emotionally is I've had to then go into the emotion of I feel injustice. I've had to go into the injustice and actually feel the injustice in every single thing that's been unjust in my life. And given 2,000 years, that's quite a few things, right? <laughs> so I've had to work my way through those emotions. And give up, emotionally give up the need for anybody outside of myself to give me anything. Now that's a huge thing to deal with. And when you come to dealing with those kind of issues yourself, if you haven't already, you'll find that that's huge, giving up all of those kind of issues. And, uh, and the key thing to bear in mind with all of this is that God gives her love and does not expect anything in return. What can you give God? There's only one thing. Your love. That's the only thing you can give God that God doesn't already have. Mm. Because God gave you the free will to express your love. Mm -hmm. right? So the only thing that you do not already, that God doesn't already have, that God didn't already make in you, mm. is the love that you are able to give to God. That's the only thing that doesn't exist. And God doesn't expect it of you. If she expected it of you, she'd be highly disappointed. Because if she expected it of everyone in the universe, there's very, very few people in the universe who truly love God. And so what would be occurring? She'd be always crying. None of my children love me. <laughs> That's what she'd be feeling, wouldn't she? If she expected it. Then she wouldn't have given us free will. That's right. So, um, so obviously, you know, in looking at God and the relationship that we have with God, we learn a lot about what we will need to give up. And so I had a lot of realizations over a period of, over these last, like in particular, last six months probably, of and particularly in meeting my soulmate, I've had a lot of these realizations that have helped me start working through all of these things. So it's been quite difficult. Do you want to hear some more? Yes. And don't just excuse me. Yeah. The, the, the last um, one you said about the, when you're in Switzerland, can you just repeat the the final one? Because it's quite a little bit. How you got to the emotion that you were trying to avoid. Oh yeah, I said, um, I want Mary to treat me well, yeah. um, but I'm avoiding feeling like nobody wants to treat me well, that I'm unloved and hated and rejected. Mm. By my soulmate specifically. Yeah. Excuse me. Um. I'm going to say it again. Isn't there a deeper emotion than, than this? It's, I'm, 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 maybe I'm just confused. I'm hearing that an event is causing an emotion which is triggering your core emotion, but I'm not hearing you get to the core, core emotion. Um, no, I'm just reading from a journal. Right. So I'm not telling you... Okay, so you're just not speaking it. Uh, well, I'm not telling you what the core emotion oh, that I feel is okay. now. I'm actually just... What I'm trying to do is illustrate to you... Have a journal, <laughs> you know, do some of this emotion. You won't know the truth when you're doing it. You won't. And I suppose what I'm trying to do is present to you how it feels for me going through these things so that you can have a bit of an idea with you, within yourself of what it's going to feel like for you going through these things. You will often not be able to access the core emotion until weeks and weeks and weeks of accessing all of the different things that affected that core emotion. You follow me? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah I do. Yeah. 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 Because all I was hearing was that, and I'm thinking, hang yeah. on. The core emotion for me began at reincarnation, why. and it's related to some events in the first yeah. century that I won't go into at this point. Yeah. 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 I can go into them later, but yeah, we'll be spending all of the time talking about me, which I don't want to mm -hmm. do. Um, oh, yes, here's another one. I've been crying for a day about uh, Mary wanting to feel powerful in our relationship. Um, do you know in relationships a lot, and you may have had this happen to you, where it seems like the other person always wants to take control, like wants to feel powerful all the time. And whenever, whenever you do something, and it might even be, you know, you don't mean to, but it just happens, that makes them feel powerless, you then, you know, you get lots of uh, anger projected at you as a result. And so my expectation was that Mary wants an equal relationship. 
the truth is that, that because of her denial of some of these emotions, she wants total control because of some first century issues. What she wants is for me to reassure her that I'll do whatever she wants. <laughs> That's the only way she can be safe now. Does that make sense? <laughs> and what am I avoiding? I'm avoiding her... I'm avoiding... Sorry, we don't, what have I got here? It's a bit hard for me to read this bit. Oh, I'm avoiding her sadness about her leaving me in the first century. Oh, sorry, I'm avoiding feeling my sadness about her leaving me in the first century and being disillusioned with me and disillusioned with love. Mm. Right? So that's the emotion that I was avoiding that particular day. Is that going. a core one? I'm still confused by core. No. Is that a core emotion, the one you just said? No, no, no. <coughs> because it seems like the onion just goes, the layers keep going. Yeah. Yeah. And by the time you've even worked out what that might be, you have to get up and go to work. I mean, you notice? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like I, I don't know how to The truth is I don't care. The truth is that all I want to do mm. is it's feel what I'm feeling right now and feel it until the end. Mm. I will work out at the end whether it's core or not core or whether it's just a fudge for another emotion or whatever. Mm. If I allow myself to feel that emotion to the end. Mm. Right. Now, be care when I say that, be careful of effect emotions. Effect emotions are always like anger, like they're all capping stuff. <coughs> anger, jealousy, rage, you know, all of those kind of emotions are all basically effect emotions. Mm. Right? And they are all covers for what are emotions within you that you don't want to feel. So I can only get angry when I don't want to feel my grief, for example. That's the only time I'll get angry. When I don't want to feel my sadness, that's the only time I get angry. When I don't want to feel like I'm unloved, I'll get angry or upset or project emotions of needing that from someone else, right? So the key is to not try to intellectualise and work out, is that core, is that not core, is that this, is that that? The key is, feel what's there. Feel what's there right now. What's there right now? What's there right now for you? What's there right now? What's the feeling? Feel that right now. Choose to feel that now. When you feel that now, none of the capping emotions will appear, like anger or rage or any of those emotions. None of those will appear. And what will be underneath all of that stuff will be deeper stuff, sure, but you will never access the deeper stuff without first feeling what's now. Because what's, what's now is your law of attraction. And that's the power of now, isn't that's it? That's the power of now. Mm. Right? And, and so when I read through some of this stuff, and I often read back through what I've written, and, and I can still feel the emotional signature there within me, I can still feel it there, then I know I've got more work to do that. So the emotion, for example, that I read earlier, where, that I felt pretty sad about, was the emotion that my, I, my, that my soulmate would rather I'd never been born. Uh, that's a huge emotion for me. And, and, it's very, and yes, it is related to deeper issues. Uh, it's related to the issue of my self-blame, the toxic shame that I've placed on myself about losing my soulmate relationship when I incarnated. That's what it's all about. Right? But I first have to feel that feeling, the feeling of she wishes I'd never been born. How does that feel? Like that somebody wishes you'd never been born. Totally not wanted. Yeah. Have you guys seen the new Sex in the City movie? Yes. Yes. It's quite good, eh? What I liked about it was that um, I saw it with my soulmate in London, actually. She came out very angry and upset. <laughs> she wouldn't hold my hand or anything. Um, so, yeah. Um, you didn't come over as Mr. B. <laughs> oh, no, it wasn't. It was just, it triggered some anger for her from the first century again. And, she couldn't feel it there and then, so yeah, it's difficult for her. But yeah, I, I enjoyed that movie a lot. It uh, because it because it did talk about a lot of interrelationship emotional issues, mm -hmm. and it was really really good. So movies are something that I've really enjoyed actually helping me with emotions. Um, who's seen uh, Pay It Forward? Yeah, yeah. yeah. lovely movie, isn't it? Um, yeah, lots of emotions about that. Um, I'm a bit of a soppy romantic. 
<laughs> obviously because, often because often because of the emotional injuries that I have about romance, which are all to do with my soulmate, missing my soulmate, and all those kind of things. So a walk to remember the notebook, um, all of those kind of things. Uh, I've watched the notebook. I'm ashamed to say, maybe not ashamed to say anymore, but. 18 times I've watched it. <laughs> the first time I had to watch it, and every time I stopped cry, I was, I was, I would stop it, and I'd go off and cry for a day or two, and then I'd come back and watch the next bit. And it just triggered huge amounts of soulmate issues for me, particularly the area of her not remembering me. And and I realise now that I've had a feeling in myself for a long, long time that I realised that she would not remember me until some emotions started coming up within. So. So that's a big movie for me. Phenomenon? Yeah. Who's seen that? John Travolta? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's good. Really um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to keep mentioning some and then I'll get to you. Um, uh, what other movies? Oh, oh, all of you probably have watched uh, What Dreams May Come. Yeah. yeah. Did you find that pretty good? There's a lot of soulmate issues for me in there. Um, so that's triggered me a lot. Um, even stuff like A Wonderful Life, James Stewart. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, lovely movie. Um, a lot of old movies I've really loved. My, my soulmate's actually a movie buff as well, so we both have that in common. And so she could list another whole list for you um, about rage, anger, and all these other things that she's uh, enjoyed as well. Um, mine have more been along the lines of uh, romantic sort of... Yeah, soppy things. There was a good movie on TV the other night, uh, an Australian show called Kinky Boots. Oh, okay. That's worth watching. Yep. Emotions oh, childhood there. issues with dad, mum, or, or uh, authoritarian figures. Bang, bang, you're dead. You ever seen that? Yeah. I highly recommend that, actually. Yeah. Uh, Even the name. And a fair to remember always, yeah, pretty much triggers me, yeah. Um, I get a bit confused. I get a bit confused when people don't be honest with me, when people are not honest with each other in a relationship, because that's something I've never been really, I could never connect to. Um, what made you decide to have 16 years difference in your relationship? Because I mean, she's relatively young. When you were that age, you had all this knowledge and remembrance. Well, I don't want to say at this point because she may finish up seeing these videos, and I'd like her to to work through those issues first before we talk about that. Um, I, I have some very clear reason like where I can understand where that's why that's occurred. Initially I was very upset about it. Not upset from the point of view of, um, of who she is because she's beautiful, but upset from the point of view of um, you know, how could she ever be attracted to me, you know, being so much older than her. Um, so I just I just saw it as a, another impediment <laughs> to mm. our Relationship. But you don't look that old. Thank you. <laughs> I don't feel that old half the time. What age difference did you have in the first century? Uh, we were only a few years apart in the first century, about five, five years. Yeah. It's just that you weren't really that advanced time. At 30, I was just totally determined. But, but my soulmate is far more tu tuned into her emotion than I've ever been until quite recently. So she, because she doesn't have that emotional damage that I began with, um, and she has had a fairly loving upbringing, mm. um, she's had a whole different uh, situation. So she, and ironically, she has also been very connected to herself emotionally all that time as well. Her parents were always into um, new age philosophies and, and desi uh, desire to feel their emotions and everything. So she's been brought up, she was, when she was 15, she was doing emotional work on herself with her, you know, just following along with her parents, but she was actually processing certain emotions. So, so she's done a lot of emotional processing work that, that I didn't even begin until I was 33. Was she born physically um, separate from you in space as well as time? In space? Was she born in South Australia? No, she was in Queensland. Yeah. And what, what music do you love and would you play as a song? Would I play? <laughs> and I love all sorts, actually. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, um, 70s. 70s, you reckon? <laughs> Depends on the emotion. No, I like some modern stuff, too. Uh, uh, I like, Leah, a lot of really good stuff. A lot of, well, I think, because I, I have very little, 
but Tristan will play some dance music and I'm fine with that too. So it's like my, 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 young, my younger son plays heavy metal rap and whatever and I'm fine with that as well. Yeah. So yeah, a lot, wide range, but the stuff I like playing is more got a, got a story or a theme to it probably. <coughs> yeah, like, a, you know, I can play Mad World too if you want or something like that. Sure. But I don't know how my voice would go with this at the moment, but uh, certainly. I'm going to know, and I've been wanting to know this for at least 30 years, yeah. 30 years perhaps, um, about recognition of your soulmate, yep. and whether certain experiences that I've had in relation to who may, may actually be my soulmate, and probably is, yep. if he was the man I was married to. Right. I've been more than 15 years or so now. But, um, Right through, especially the early days of our relationship, we knew things about each other which we had no way of knowing. You know, it was, it was spiritual stuff. Yeah. And we were deeply into that. And I'd, if I was across the other side of town mm -hmm. and I had a bad attack of something, which was in, I was in pain, he would feel the pain yeah. way over the other side of the town. Yeah. And then there was one time I had this dream <coughs> that I had... Um, seen this man who looked very much like John and he was standing outside a certain house and I just like the edge and the gate and the footpath and he was trying to sell something yeah. and I, I described this article that he was trying to sell and guns were something I knew nothing about, I had no exposure apart from an antique ornament or well, anyway um, I shouldn't say I knew nothing about it, but anyway, I didn't know about brand names and what they were called. Can I stop you for a moment? All that detail. Can I stop you? You're wanting to tell a story. Do you know why you're wanting yeah, to tell yes. a story? I, I want to know whether the fact that I knew all this, and as you can imagine, it turned out that that was him, and it was Winchester, and it was green and buff yeah. and in the folder, even the cleaning... You're back to telling the story again? Yeah. You know, just to emphasise all that detail that came to me, yeah. and when I described it to him, it was exactly what had happened. Yeah. The, 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 but you're capable of doing that with every single person in this room. Mm. Yeah, I just wondered whether it meant that there was some much more meaningful connection there than well, just... Well, you're capable of doing that with every person in this room. Mm -hmm. So I what I'm I saying is... I understand that in a way. But see, I... but see, you're not hearing me at the moment because you want to believe that this man is your soulmate. And that's okay. Mm. I'm not saying he's not. I'm saying that you are capable of doing mm -hmm. what you're... The reasoning that you've got about you yeah. feeling that he's your soulmate, yeah, right. you're actually capable of doing exactly the same thing with yeah. all the people in this room. Okay. Yeah. But that doesn't mean he's not soulmate. No. What I'm saying is your soul but is capable of that. So. He's not necessarily no. so just on that, on that particular mm -hmm. yeah. thing. Is yeah. that, does that make yeah. sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and to just take the question one step further, is it likely to happen that um, one does marry one's soulmate on this earth at yeah. this time? And the fact that you've divorced and gone your separate ways, I mean, I can see why there's a very good reason, and I have progressed in my Walk. spiritual life a whole lot more since we've been mm. there, and I can see a good reason why yep. we've gone our separate ways. I mean, we're still a good opposite, good terms and everything. Yeah. I rang him up the other day to wish him happy birthday. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, One thing, can I just stop you again? <laughs> I'm going to stop you again. Yeah. What you are doing, there's an emotion driving what you are currently doing. Mm -hmm. What's the emotion? Well, then I'm still connected to him. I, I, I know that. I've realised that all along. Okay, so what are you going to do about it? Well, I suppose I've been working my way through that for years and years. I don't think that it's so what done. are you wanting from me? Well, I just wondered whether it's likely that one would marry one's soulmate and yet... Well, no, no, no. What you're wanting from me is you want me to confirm that he's your soulmate. That's what you want from well, me. Well, yes, if you did. But if you said no... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so but saying no would actually confirm he's not your soulmate, and I don't want to do that either. But can you see how at the moment you're projecting a need at me to give you something? I just want to know the... The you know. Well, talk to God about that. Mm, I do. <laughs> so why are you worrying? Why are you talking to me about that? <laughs> Can you and see I what know, I'm saying? And I mean, even if I do get the firm to answer, I still don't know if there's anything I should do about it. I mean, exactly. I'm not doing anything and even if you get an affirmative answer, it doesn't mean you're going to believe me or not. Can you see that? Like. We love you singing. <laughs> It's probably a good idea that you go before I see you. <laughs> no worries. <laughs>
Uh, yes, definitely. If that's your question, do a lot of couples meet? Certainly, that's certainly okay. Yes. Well, no, no. There is an emotion driving your. There was an emotion driving your long story, and you weren't asking a question during that story. You were stating a lot of facts, but you weren't asking a question because you wanted me first to understand something about your life before you asked the question. But that is a need that you're projecting in me. The simplest thing for you to do... Help has been through this particular emotion. So help can help you a lot with this emotion. I tried. At, <laughs> at the beginning... She didn't ring me back anymore. <laughs> at, at the beginning, Helga, Helga would tell this long 10-minute story to me. And I'm saying to Helga, What's the question you want to ask? <laughs> and the question got down to one line or two lines. Right? We want to tell the story because there's an emotion driving us to tell the story. And you need to connect to that emotion. And it's not loving for me to listen to your story and help you be disconnected to that emotion. Do you follow me? Can you see what I'm saying there? Yeah. Like, what I need to do is help you connect to the story. The sto the, it's connect to the emotion. The story is told because you want me to understand. So what's the emotion you feel? I'm misunderstood. And you don't want to feel that. Right? That's why you don't want to ask the question just like just straight out. I, is my husband Simon? I say, I won't answer that. The second question would be, is it possible to meet your soulmate and marry him? Of course. Most people finish up doing that at some point. Mm -hmm. The third question. All of those questions could have been handled in just a few seconds of time. <coughs> but they weren't because of the emotion that's driving you. The need. The need for you to be understood mm -hmm. is driving you. Do you follow me? And ironically, you're not understanding yourself right at that moment. Because right at that moment, you want me to understand you and you do not even understand yourself. You do not understand that it's the emotion of need of me to understand that's driving you to ask the question. Which is the job of being misunderstood. And I can tell someone welling up on you. Exactly. That's it. That's it. So let yourself feel that emotion. That's, that will help you release that emotion. That will help you a lot. Does everyone follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. So, so if I just if I didn't block that coming from from her, what would be yeah. happening now is that she'd be still wanting me to understand, but now she's in the emotion. Yes. Right. And this is what you can do with yourself too. Right. Feel the underlying emotion. Let yourself feel what's going on inside of yourself. Yeah. Are we allowed to assist others doing that if that's what we feel? Certainly assist others, but again, be careful of your intention. What's your intention? Is your intention to actually work through your own stuff, or is your intention to stay connected with yourself while you're doing it, or is your intention to live your life through their emotions? What's your intention? Because it, it, it's very different as to what, how good or bad it's going to be for you when you're helping others. Yeah. So, so my feelings even with these groups at the moment, for me, is what you project at me helps me deal with lots of stuff. Mm. Yeah? So I've never played my guitar in front of a group of people before. <laughs> like a big group like this. Mm. I played in front of Millie's church at one point, wasn't it? It was about 40 there, but I had Millie by my side, which I might ask her to come back here. <laughs> do it, do it, Millie. Millie. <laughs> 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 I can, I'm just joking, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Millie's a far more beautiful singer than I'll ever be. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know if you know the rest of this song. Do you? Yeah. Mad no. Girl. Let's see, Mad Girl. You've got, you've got it on there. Sorry? You've got it on the books. Now, I haven't sang for about five weeks because. Uh, <laughs> We've been crying. We've been crying. <laughs> <laughs> Which is it? Uh, under J. J. Mm. Black one? Mm. Now I'm not very good at it because 
are either, so you can expect some fancy things. <laughs> I'm learning everything. Uh, just get the words for Millie so that she can sing the song. Sorry? Because most guitars are right handed. And so, because you get taught right handed. Yeah, so I, I just find it convenient. I have some there. Is it Jay? Maybe you should find it with Jay. It's not there. It's not bad, well Matt M. Who is it that sings it? Gary Jewel. Gary Jewel. G. Something G. Yeah. Is he? 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 Is he
to be faded to telling only lies but my dreams they are as empty as my songs eh? so um, one day I was playing uh, some Elvis songs I was up here in Yippie actually playing some Elvis songs with a small group of people and we were just singing them and uh, one of the uh, my daughter Sarah from the first century has reincarnated and uh, she lives in Canada now with her song mate it's, it's Luke the Bible writer Luke who wrote the book of Luke in the Bible and uh, and she's a very very good medium and she was with me at the time and uh, and, uh, and so I was singing these songs and I'm feeling, all of a sudden I felt, Elvis is here. Mm. So, uh, so he's not left the building, he's actually left the building. <laughs> anyway, um, I said to Kate, uh, that's her name now, Sarah's name now, I said to Kate, uh, no, I'm sure Elvis is here at the moment, I can feel him. And, and sure enough, he was. And he said he wanted to trance channel through Kate, uh, which uh, Kate let him do. And he was, he, he hadn't played, this was about, uh, this happened about a year ago. And he hadn't played music since he passed. And he hadn't sung since he passed either. Um, and this happens to a lot of musicians on earth actually. When they pass, they actually don't sing. Like Karen Carpenter, you've heard of Karen yes. Carpenter. She hasn't sung since she's passed. Um, 
So, yeah, so there's a lot of musicians who, who, who pass in so sort of a fairly negative moral state, mm. of course, and so, and so they feel so terrible emotions mm. inside of themselves that they, uh, they feel like they can't sing anymore. Because in the spirit world, you can only sing when you feel good. Mm. And a lot of times when you're feeling terrible emotions, obviously you don't feel good, so you don't feel like you can sing. And Elvis, because of his fame, had huge amounts of projected emotion. So every single person, like every time there's an anniversary of his death, there's this huge projected emotion going to Elvis. And what happens with projected emotion is that it establishes a, what you would call a psych psychical link, but it's actually an energy stream. Uh, you see it as a blue light when in the spirit world. An energy stream that connects the person who's mourning for you with you and you feel totally drawn to go and actually stop them from mourning about you that's the feeling you get drawn into that when you're in the spirit world and so he's got like thousands or hundreds of thousands of people every year year after year after year doing this with him so of course after a while he wants to detune from that he wants to get away from that so what he did was he, he renamed himself he renamed himself as John and then uh, stopped speaking with any person, any medium, anybody on earth. And he was on the divine love path. He'd, he'd learned a bit about God, and he was on the divine love path, but wasn't sure about how it all worked. But he had this longing for God and rec had received some divine love. And when we caught up with him, he was in the second sphere of the spirit world. So in the second sphere, I think I've described it to you, the second sphere is like far better than the prettiest place you can find on earth. So he's already in quite a pretty place, <coughs> him, right? Ironically, his mother, who was a born-again Christian when she was on earth, is in a worse place than he is in the spirit world. And uh, he was trying to help her. But he came to us because he had quite a love, like he was quite, he had a handsome appearance, of course, when he was on earth, and quite a good body. And he said that there were cracks and fissures in his body in his spirit body, that he couldn't understand why they were there. And he wanted to know what was going on. And, um, and so we started talking about his emotions of shame and guilt about his life on earth. Mm -hmm. uh, the emotions of his life on earth, of particularly the things he did in his later life, mm -hmm. which he was very ashamed and felt very guilty about, which were the cause of all of these different body problems that he was having in the spirit form. And after we began talking about that, we talked about that for about 10 or 15 minutes and he actually started connecting with some emotions and had to leave and he, he started working through some of the emotions that were the result of that. But in amongst that discussion you sort of learn a few things in the process, you know, and, and so we learned things about, you know, his feelings about when he passed and, and how he felt, you know, in the spirit world, being in the spirit world with all these projections of emotions at him. And also how he feels now about how he was feeling then. And then he came five months later and talked to us as well. And he's now singing again and, uh, and playing instruments again. And it's a bit different when you play them in the spirit world. And he's, yeah, quite, uh, he's quite high now in, this, in the spirit world, working through his things. And he's on the divine love path and he understands the divine love path completely now. Um, so he's doing very well. He's trying to help his mother as well. So his mother is quite an angry person on this. So. AJ, is that what happens when someone passes and you and you long for them or you mourn for them endlessly? You actually trap them? Yes. Many people who are trapped on the earth plane are actually trapped because of your grief. Um, you remember in the movie... Uh, um, no, no. Um, what Dreams May Come. You remember how you know he was with her while she was feeling these emotions. And then it sort of depicted him walking away from her while she was crying. Do you remember that scene where she was at a grave site screaming about you know, the pain she was feeling? And he walked away from her and that was the last time he saw her on the earth. Quite the opposite of often the case. When a person is grieving for you emotionally in, on earth, the spirit often wants to stay with the person for as long as they're grieving. But the problem is that it prevents the spirit from actually working out where they are and what they need to do to work through their stuff to progress with themselves. And so um, the grieving emotions, while it's appropriate to feel your grief, directing them at the person creates huge amounts of trouble for the person in the spirit world. 
Understand that your feelings of grief are because you have yet to release some emotions about your belief system. What are the beliefs? That's the end. That's the end of life altogether as soon as we die or there's no spirit world or, you know, that I've lo I won't ever see them again or I've lost contact with them. And none of those beliefs are true. And the truth is that you need to release all those false beliefs emotionally. And that's what grieving is about, releasing those false beliefs emotionally. So, the key thing for you if you're grieving, the key thing for you if you're grieving is to let yourself feel your emotions, but don't project them at the person that you're grieving for. Because when you do that, you're actually keeping them connected with you and not allowing them to actually move forward in their own progression. And Joe, does that also happen when you don't grieve and you push grief away? Certainly. Remember, I've said that whenever you're not feeling an emotion, you're projecting the emotion. So it's the same thing. Yeah. yeah. So what's the best thing you can do for someone who's passed and you know they're not in a good state? Or you suspect that they, you know, they passed with a lot of, a lot of issues unresolved. What's and the, the best first, thing? What I would do is I would uh, get a vid DVD of one of the Secrets of the Universe's DVDs, sit down with them, long for them to sit down with you next year, and say, I want you to watch this DVD now with me. Yes, I would do it with your DVDs. Yeah, or you can make one of your own. You can do the diagrams yourself and explain it all. Whatever, whatever. So that is how we do it. Yeah, and what that does is it opens up their conceptions, it opens up their belief system to see what the truth is, and that straight away will allow them to investigate things they would not have normally investigated. See, just the act of passing is a very, very sensitive time for a spirit. And the reason why is that many people on earth don't believe in a spirit world until they pass. Now that is a time when if you take the opportunity you can teach so many things of truth to the person. And that's why the majority of celestial spirits do not spend much time in the sixth sphere talking to sixth sphere spirits. The majority of them spend huge amounts of time in the hells or in the first sphere talking to spirits who have just passed or are just working through emotions. And the reason why is because the spirit in the sixth sphere has already got a very, very predetermined set of beliefs that a spirit in the first sphere doesn't have. And they are very, very difficult to help to get on the divine path when you've got a very specific set of beliefs. So if you have loved ones that have passed, Allow yourself to talk to them. They will hear you when you talk to them. <coughs> right? you're not, you don't, don't think you're talking to yourself. They will hear you. You will get feelings in response to them if they're able to give you those feelings. Some of them won't be in a space where they're able to do that. Depending on what their life was like morally and what their life was like in terms of their love and all those kind of things will depend on what they'll be able to give you in return. But don't think that they can't hear you because they can now, they have free will too. They might want to say, what a load of rubbish, and yeah. walk off. And that's okay too. And you may even feel when they do that. You've at least done the right thing to try and get them to on at the right At least, path. Yeah. yeah. There's so much help you can give. Knowing the truth, yep. there is so much help you as a person on earth can give people in the first sphere of the spirit world. Mm. And one of the things that I would dearly love to be able to do is sit down with a, like hundreds of mediums and actually talk about how to interact with spirits in the first sphere to help them progress on the, on the divine path. Have there been many spirits sitting in on our meeting today? Yeah, there's, there's, there's over 100,000 actually today. You're, you're looking at us. No, they're um, looking at us. <laughs> they're looking at us, Sorry, but they're angel. sort of like, this has become for them a huge amphitheatre mm. that, that many of them are connected to you, but there's also a lot of knowledge now in the spirit world that these kind of classes are mm -hmm. happening on a regular basis. And uh, yeah, they, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of people. Angie, can I just ask a question? Like all the prayers of these hundreds of millions of people that would be projected to Jesus, what's happening to those prayers now you're incarnated? And what happens when you pray? Do you, do you answer them? Or do you just say, oh, that's my issue? <laughs> and firstly, the majority of people who are praying to Jesus actually believe me to be God. So in that case, all of their energy actually goes to God, not to me. 
So that's the first thing to understand. All of their energy is actually flowing to God, which is appropriate. That's where it really needs to flow. And obviously I do feel lots of different emotions from people who are wanting my assistance. And in, in my sleep state, I give a lot of that assistance now. Um, and yeah, there's a, there's a lot of truths too that I can't speak about at this moment that are difficult would be difficult for you to understand about multi-dimensional space and 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 that allow that allow me to do things concurrently in different places. <clears throat> um, but the main thing to understand is that if a person longs for you, then you will if they you feel their desire is sincere, you will try to help them. And so I do try to do to help them too. Um, but I'm no different than you. Right? So I'm going to try to help them because I want to help them, I love them, just like you would want to try to help them if the same feeling was given to you. But the majority of them are actually, um, and, and at times in the spirit world, um, I get a little, um, particularly in my state now, I'm still not in the state back at, at, at a wonder state, in that bliss state, because of the emotions that are still within me. I feel quite uncomfortable with the projection of emotions. So, at Christmas time and Easter time at times, and I usually have a lot of solitude. Um, and even when I was in the spirit world, every single year at Christmas time and Easter time, I would retire to my own to my own home um, because I, I I just didn't feel it was right accepting all of that emotion from people when it needs to be directed to God. So um, for that reason, I don't <coughs> celebrate even my own birthday, and I never have. Uh, even from the first century um, and a lot of the celebrations that tied into my life are actually tied too so um, so I obviously don't agree with those things um, so the majority of times though the feelings are directed towards God so and that's where it needs to be directed so those born again Christians that are oh Jesus Jesus they're waving their arms and well, I can't, what's talking in tongues what's that it's a spirit entering them. Is it? Yeah. Really a, is. a benevolent one? Um, well, not always. Like, uh, there's this lady I, I was talking to recently in England. And she had five spirits with her when she came to my group. And uh, all of the five spirits were heavy, heavy like they were born again Christians on earth. Mm. They were all in the first sphere of the spirit world. And they all had some very, very specific beliefs about, about God and how she should practice her worship with God. To the extent that she, they would injure her physically if she didn't practice what they told her to practice. Wow. And so they were obviously not benevolent, they were malevolent. Mm. And, uh, and obviously we had to talk to those spirits about what they were doing to this lady. And once she uh, disconnected from those spirits, um, she could actually work out a lot of things after that point. But she was very heavily influenced, she's a very good medium, she's very heavily influenced by these five spirits who are attached to her. So just because a person's a Christian on earth, it doesn't mean that they're going to... It just depends on the emotions inside of them. The emotions inside of these particular ones is they were all slaves in the 18th century on the earth. They all had heavy Christian beliefs, but they were all slaves. And a lot of their, their uh, emotions about being slaves were all about anger with the people that had hurt them. And they were holding on to that anger, they weren't letting that go. And so they weren't in a good place themselves. And what happened with this lady, she was black too. So she had a lot of racial hatred as well within her because of terrible abuse that she'd received at the hands of white men in particular. And those two things caused the connection between herself and those spirits. Mm. Mm, thank you. So, yeah. so AJ, how do we find out if, if some of these spirits are hanging around? Like, oh, I don't seem to get that character. I don't seem to... Like it's always some other people have this amazing character. I'm like, just going around in a circle. So, um, like, oh, because I, I, you know, I don't want this baggage, all these things hanging around me. I, I would love to be. You know, Every single spirit that's attracted to you is attracted to you for a reason. They're there to help trigger your emotion. Mm. And so, if you can look at it that way, rather than looking at them as baggage, mm. right? They are actually helping you access to a more powerful degree your own emotion. Mm. The key for you now is to let yourself feel your own emotion. Once you feel it and release it, you also release the law of attraction with that spirit. 
which means that spirit will no longer be interested in you. And if they're malevolent, they'll go somewhere else. If they're benevolent, then they'll also probably back off from you and start progressing. So there's a lot you can do to assist the spirits around you. Um, Diane's not here today, is she? But there's a lovely lady up in, in Gibby who stays with uh, Millie. And she, honestly, she will tell you straight to your, uh, to your face that she has lots of emotions she needs to work through. But every single night, pretty much, or most days, she talks to some spirits that are with her and, and helps them get onto the divine love path. And she often feels the spirits come and she knows, oh, that one's attracted to me because of this emotion I just had, or that one's attracted to me. Or I played some music that I really love and that spirit came who, who produced that music. Or, and, and then she talked to them, you know, and she could feel them there. The key is, when you trust your emotions, you will then know somebody else, the presence, you'll feel the presence of somebody else there, and you can just speak to them like we're speaking, even if you can't feel an answer in response. Yeah. Ajahn, where, where do dreams come from? What part of you? Um, do they come from spirit or do they come from soul? If you're talking about where they can come from, there's probably three places where they can come from. Um, one place is your own soul and its unresolved emotions. So if you wake up from a dream feeling you know, an emotion, then that's an unresolved emotion that you are not dealing with in your day-to-day -day life. And you're refusing to deal with it, but in your sleep state you are wanting to deal with it. And so you're giving yourself a message, if you like, of what emotion you're avoiding. So that's one. The second type of dreams are sort of inspirational, I suppose you could call them. And many of those come through spirits to you. Uh, and in the end, many of them come from God. In, in a way, it's a way of God communicating with you about reass and re reassuring you. And uh, many of those kind of dreams are based around giving you confidence or trust or hope or those kind of emotions. And then the third type would be uh, dreams that you dream because you're actually there. And in your sleep state, every single night you go to sleep, you are actually awake in your sleep state. Your spirit body and your soul is awake, and you're roaming the spirit world in the areas where you can get to, talking to people, setting up events, you know, meeting people, meeting new people, setting up meetings on earth with them, and all sorts of things. And you're doing that every night. So I met all of you in the sleep state before I met you in the and so we we'll wake up tired sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and you can do this while you're still awake, walking around, and you're getting... Of course you can. And this is what, a, what they classify as an out-of-body experience, which is, a, which is an out... You know, a lot of people don't do it because where their law of attraction is, is in the first sphere. And in the first sphere, there's a lot of very ugly and angry people. And so you meet them if you go out of body and you, and you attract them if those emotions are within yourself. Right? So obviously it's very uncomfortable doing it and so most people get very frightened and detuned from it. So I detuned from that when I was a young child because uh, I had too many very frightening experiences. My question I met was even though you're walking around and alert and yep. doing your everyday life, uh, the vision is like mm -hmm. a dream but you're alert. Um, yeah, well that kind of a vision is different than an out-of-body experience. Mm -hmm. So an out-of-body experience, your physical form, you won't be conscious of what it's doing. Mm -hmm. So I've had periods of time where I've just been sitting down like this and all of a sudden, three hours later, it's three hours later, mm -hmm. and I'm still sitting like this. And what's happened in between? Like, do I know that there was just a time space in between that I had three hours and I don't know where it went. I didn't go to sleep. And so at that moment, there was an out-of-body experience. And the consciousness is with the spirit body and the soul. Right? And because of the disconnection, I still feel between the two. Obviously, I'm not conscious of that in the awake state. Now, that's happened quite often. And that happens quite often to lots of people. Yeah. Um, a vision is a bit different. A vision is more something, inspiration generally, that's given to you by a spirit. And the spirit feeds you things about their life to help you with their emotions or they're connected with you in some way or they're feeding you truths that uh, they feel you, you need to look, what they believe are truths that they feel you need to look at. Do you have many spirits sort of uh, bothering you, hanging around, wanting to have a chat all the time? 
um, go through these unworthiness emotions. I've had lots of malevolent spirits around me. Um, at one stage, I had around 50 or 60,000 malevolent spirits all projecting anger at me. Um, could, you, could you feel that? And yeah, yeah. yeah. So what do you do? I just and cry. But don't we pray about the power of prayer? In, in your definition of well, that, the, my prayer. Well, my prayer is to do with all my emotions. Right. There's obviously 50,000 spirits wanting to be angry at me for oh, some yeah. reason yeah. within me. So I needed to deal with that emotion. So all I did was feel it. I did see. I see. Unlike you, I don't try to prevent it. Mm, mm, mm. He welcomes it. I welcome it. I don't try to prevent it. It's just an experience that's occurred to trigger some emotions in me. You follow me? Yeah. So I don't try and prevent these events. I just try to feel my emotions. That's why they're there for to help. God's already helping me. That's my prayer. Mm. I want like constantly to deal with my emotions. That's my prayer. So God's already helping me do that through that attraction. The law of attraction is at work. Now, once I worked through and cried about that and let myself feel all those projections of anger and the unworthiness that was in me as a result, they all went. They all just left me. I told you said before you already met us before here in the physical. What do you no, in the sleep state. In the sleep state. Yeah, yeah. So every night you go to sleep, you're in the spirit world. And I met you there at night. Well, I was there too. And we like, talked. Yeah, like we, a deja vu. Groups like this. Yeah, that's why many of you, when you first saw me, thought, oh, I think I've saw you before. Yeah. Many deja of you, many of you said that to me. I thought you were in the court. I thought you must have been in the court. Yeah. I felt I'd seen you up there. Yeah. And, and the truth is that you have seen me before, but it was in our sleep state. That's where you saw, you saw me before. And all these feelings of deja vu that happen, they're all related to sleep state experiences. Because mountains actually move for us three to get here. Yeah. yeah. Not the ocean. Mountains. <laughs> <laughs> so, so obviously at the soul level you really wanted to, you wanted to hear this in your awake state. So most of you have heard all of this information in your sleep state and you wanted to hear this information in your awake state. And it's in the awake state that you're now hearing it. That's going to help you deal with all of these emotions that are preventing the connection that occurs between your sleep and awake states. Life. So it's going to help you be whole. You know, okay. being fragmented. We'd like to hear more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, what, what he's doing is actually projecting an emotion that I should tell you. <laughs> you can ask the real question, which is <laughs> Would you like to tell them about what we've got planned for the future? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, on uh, August the 9th and 10th, um, August the 9th, I think, in spe specifically. Um, there will be a, a, a meeting in Brisbane um, and uh, you will need to, is it, is it something, I don't know all the details at this point but... Uh, Grant, Grant's, nice. Grant's going to facilitate it, uh, yeah. Grant Wolven. Grant's going to email your email list, is that what he's doing or...? Uh, we haven't worked out the details but, okay. but if people... It will tell everyone about it who, who we've got an email address for yeah. and give them the address and give them Grant's phone number so they can book in for that so that we know, they know who's coming and everything like that. Yeah. 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 Grant's got a pretty big email. Yeah. I'm not sure there might be a couple of hundred people there so there might not be the opportunity to ask personal questions like we've had in the smaller group. But um, my, my desire for that group is to be a question and answer group because almost all the people that Grant will be having there will be people who have observed the DVDs, the introductory DVDs, and then will obviously want to ask questions about that. So if you do come, you might find it a bit of a rehash of some of the information you've already seen because of the questions you've already asked. Um, on the Sunday, I think he wants it specifically for Deeksha. Blessing yeah. givers, yeah. yeah. And uh, I agreed to that at the time. Now you're having doubts. Oh, well, no. Um, normally I wouldn't do something for a specific group. Normally I'd want to leave it open. But there are specific questions that many of the ones in the Deeksha movement are wanting to ask. So I wanted to give them that opportunity too. Then on August the 23rd and 24th, 23rd and 24th of August, we will be here again. Um, I think we were saying 1 o'clock on Saturday. And then we were thinking maybe something like 11 or something on Sunday, uh, where we begin uh, a bit earlier, and maybe then have a break for lunch or whatever, and then continue. Oh, yes. Um, so, so, and also if you wanted to leave earlier, then like a lot have had to now, mm. 
take his leave a bit earlier without missing too much. And will one follow on the other, or will they be independent? Um, I just, you know me well enough to find. Well, well, I just take everything as it comes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so what questions? What question yeah. you ask? Lead me down this road. Yeah. And fair enough. And that's the road we went down. And um, I feel the law of attraction will help work through things. If if there is anything that we're going to cover, it will certainly be more about truth, emotions and God and those kind of subjects. So, and there's a lot I want to say about cause and effect and things like that as well. Um, you know, that God only listens to prayers that are to do with causes, for example. And, and I want to expand on that subject. But it all just depends on, um, you know, what questions come up and so forth. With regard to what's happened over the last two days and last week, uh, Peter is going to get sorted out a lot of DVDs and everything. They'll be costing, again, if it's two or th three, probably 15 bucks, or two of them will be 10 bucks. Um, that's the cost price that it takes to, to do all of that. That's not even including Peter's work or Peter, Peter pays a lady to do a lot of this stuff. So if you want to contribute to that, then please do so and, and, and give the funds to Peter so that he's got the opportunity to print more DVDs and do all of that kind of work. The CDs we've been giving out for free as well, but they're normally a couple of bucks to produce. So again, if you, if you, if you can just think about donating some funds there about that. And also, with these groups, they're going to start probably getting a bit larger as time goes on. And we'll need people to help with things like tidying up afterwards and mm. those kind of things. So if you can just bear that in mind when we're at a group uh, or whatever, that there's some things that probably need to be done to tidy up, that'd be lovely. Um, I'm just going to continue giving my time in the way that I'm giving it now. Um, and But obviously the way the world's structured is that there's costs associated with producing a lot of this stuff. Mm. So um, if, if you feel, feel free to contribute to those things and... Um, I don't have anybody contributing to myself because I prefer that every bit of money that's received goes back into producing more things. Mm. Yesterday, uh, a lady offered to type up a book called The Post-Mortem Journal. She's, she's given me, um, she's asked me to give you her address because she's be not great. here today. That'd be great, yeah. so if you can do that. Um, what will happen <coughs> is that if you want to read that book, it's a channeling by a lady called Jane Sherwood of of Lawrence of Arabia's personal experience on, upon passing into the spirit world. The first seven or eight chapters in particular are really good, a good read because they focus on what he had to do emotionally to progress. And, uh, and it's very important to have a, good, have a read of it, I feel. So what we're going to do is get that typed up, and then if you want, it's an out of print book, and if you want to receive a copy of that, please again let Peter know. I found it in the used section of Amazon last night. It's wow. 45 bucks though. Yeah, yeah. I bought a copy for 44 bucks just recently, mm -hmm. but it's out of print. So. Yeah, well, they, so. Have, they have another probably 20 copies for $45 and one for 30 Yeah, yeah. What's the name of the book? It's called Post Mortem Journal, and it's by Jane Sherwood. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the, it's a book I'd love to get onto the DVDs as well. Mm. They're channeled, they are channeled by Robert James Lees, who lived, I actually met his children though when I was overseas in England. Um, he lived in the 19, early 1900s, from some 18 something to 1934 or something like that. And he channeled three, a series, he channeled a lot of material, but three books in particular were about the divine love part, and that's the the Three of the Mists, mm. The Life of Elysian, and The Gate of Heaven. Robert James Lee's now. Yeah, he's in the he's in the celestial sp spheres. Yeah, as are all of the spirits who are mentioned in that book. Yeah. Feel free to leave whenever you want. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Jane Sherwood is the writer of that. <laughs> Does Paget ever come through and talk to you? Um, he has come through Kate to talk to us. Has he? Yes. Do you know what he had to say?